How terrible is truth that does not profit the wise. When Oedipus comes out and he looks over his people and as he comes out on the stage, he is struck by the disaster that struck his land. Oedipus sees uh, chaos. His people are plagued, they're sick, and they're hungry, and they look to him for help and guidance. He knows he's a good ruler, and he will help them. He's helped them before, he's confident he can do it again. But he's not sure what to do. So he does what any good ruler should do in that circumstance. He seeks out the wisest man, the wisest person that he knows. And in that time, that is Tiresias. Now, Tiresias is a prophet of prophets. He is a person, though blind, who can see the future. He's clairvoyant. He can see change. If anyone can see what to do next, it's this man. So Oedipus asks him, what should I do? What's, what's next? How do I save my people? And Tiresias says this. How terrible is truth that does not profit the wise. Had I known this, I would not be here. I wouldn't come to help. I would have saved them. And it was obviously not very happy with this answer. And I think when we hear that answer, it strikes us as a little odd, too. Uh, truth is good, right? Truth will set you free. Truth is, uh, even from a scientific standpoint, uh, what we base everything on, right? Truth is that's good. Well, I'm actually struck. I think when I heard this and read this, it strikes me as very reminiscent of a conversation that we're having now currently in the debate of free will versus determinism. The idea that we don't actually have free will. And of course, Oedipus, I think, is a great example of this play, a man trapped by fate. But in this conversation of free will, that the idea that we may not have it, there are scientists, philosophers, who are concerned. They say, well, I, they kind of know the truth. Maybe we don't have free will. But let's not tell everybody. That, that could be dangerous. That could lead to some bad things. Maybe people, I don't know, it can be bad. And that's, I have a couple of quotes to, to uh, elucidate this. Now, Daniel Dennett, the Roman philosopher, writer, uh, it's very rational, it seems right. Uh, free will, uh, before we remove life affirming free will, uh, caution is called for on all sides. Uh, Paul Davis, over in an article I read, uh, he stated this If you thought eugenics was a disastrous perversion of science, imagine a world where people don't believe in free will. You almost hear the dumb, dumb, dumb at the end. So scary. Like, I had dinner with Friday, I promised I did not prompt this. He simply he offered it on his own. Even though there are people who don't believe in free will now, what's the world coming to? That's kind of where the conversation is at right now. It's a concern. The science is pointing in a particular direction. But the concern is, you know what? While the science is pointing to this, it maybe has that uh, disastrous implications for us. Well, I disagree with that. I do. Even though this seems pretty disastrous, I'll admit. Uh, I disagree with that. I'm actually very excited about a future without free will. I think it's an interesting and uh, and a revolutionary way to look at one another, to look at the world, and to look at our society, our Thebes, our America. And I'd like to share with you just a few points that I think uh, have impacted me, and I hope they impact you. Now, when I watch Oedipus, the play, I'm struck with empathy for the character on, on screen. I, spoiler alert here, if you haven't seen it, uh, it does not go well. I should have probably said spoiler before this picture. Uh, he's not doing well. Uh, it doesn't go well for him. So, but the point with the play is you actually feel a great empathy for this character. Now, this character does really the two worst things you could do in the ancient world. He, and still pretty bad today, uh, sleeps with his mother and murders his father. But seriously, that's, that's pretty dark stuff, right? So, but at the end of this play, somehow you feel an empathy for this, this person. Well, in my mind, actually, the idea that people don't have free will and that they are in some ways fated makes me more empathetic for them. And I'll give you an example. Say you uh, make a decision or a choice, which I, I disagree with. Maybe you use mayo instead of miracle whip or something. And I say, well, that's crazy. Who would do that? I could use that as an opportunity to say, well, I'm a better person. I clearly would have chosen miracle whip, or I wouldn't have done that. Uh, and so I, I, I'm better. I would have, if I were you, I would have chosen that. But without free will, we actually can't say that. And I think that's a great thing. <coughs> To me, when I look at another person and I see the choices that they make, and I think to myself, if I were them, if I switched out all the DNA, all the physiology, all of the experiences, all of everything that makes them them, I would be them. I would make the same choices. I would do the same things. And so that unlocks an empathy for me and all people. 
And I'm excited about that. I'm very excited about it. And also reduce his ego. You know, like what to me is exciting because and no, Kanye should keep his ego. That's way fun. But like to me, it reduces my ego because honestly, if I can't sit here and say, well, I'm I would have done your life better than you would do it. When we look at someone and judge them for the choices that they make, that's essentially what we're saying. We're saying, I'm better, I would be better at being you than you are. And I don't feel that we have room for that. I don't think that that's a necessary thing. And this is not a new idea, certainly. Uh, this is as old as, uh, I mean, religion. It, basically, what I'm saying is walk a mile in another person's shoes, right? It's not new. But to me, it has greater impact because I understand the science of it, reading some great uh, philosophers. And to me, it's, it's, not, it's not new. There but for the grace of God go I. There but for the grace of causal determinacy go I. I mean, that's essentially what it is. And also, to me, it actually really puts forward a need to educate. Even more so, we need to value education even more than we've ever done. You know, when people tell me, they say, well, I don't believe it very well, and they say, well, why don't you just do whatever? I mean, if you know, give in this sort of a level of fatalism, just, it doesn't matter, right? Well, this is the same pushback I got. I actually went to Bible college to become an atheist. Well, oh, sorry. Uh, I get my purpose and result causes confused sometimes. I went to a Bible college and became an atheist. And um, I actually, I, I get that pushback a lot. I said, well, if you don't believe in God, why do good things? You know? uh, well, in fact, I, uh, because I've been educated, because I have the background that I have, because of my, I have my family, my wife, and my friends, and all the educational experiences, not the least of which at the University of Kentucky, I feel compelled to not just do the right thing because thou shalt not, but thou shalt not because. I'm a part of, of this great story of the human experience in the 21st century. I'm a part of something so much greater than myself, and I'm so proud to be a part of it. I'm educated, and I want to be a positive force in this world. There are so many great reasons not to give into fatalism, but free will is not one of them, in my particular opinion. And that leads me to my last point. When you look at the world, and you look at it, and, and when Evans looked at his world, he saw problems, he saw issues that he needed to resolve. Uh, when I look at uh, America and I look at the world today, we have issues, we have things that we need to resolve. One of which, I think, is not being really talked about, but we all have this sense that our prison system is getting out of, out of control. I'll leave in one, one quick point. Right now, America is number one, yay, number one, uh, in incarceration rates per capita, which means that we, and I'll put it in perspective, all, all the people in the jail in the world, one in four, almost one in four, as of 2009, are in jail here in America. Think about that. So when I look at that, what, is, what, does, what does that tell me? When you look at number two and number three, number two is right now is Rwanda, and if you look at uh, Canada, 123rd, are we that much more safe? No, I think it's because we over-rely on choice. We over-penalize on this idea that bad people choose bad things, and we we look at them simply from that choice perspective, rather than empathize with them, reducing our ego, not judging them, but really factor in. I think it's lazy to say, oh, well, they made a bad choice. What we can do is look at them and all the myriad of things that make them who they are, and look about how can we prevent that. I think the great sort of lie that we perpetuate, and not just in incarceration rates, but in economic divide, is that poor choose poverty. Incarcerated people, criminals, choose criminality. But if you could really set people down before the world, before they were born, and educate them and say, I'm going to introduce you into this great world, and I'm going to introduce you into the 21st century, and you can you have free will, you can choose whatever you want. Who would choose poverty? Who would choose to hurt one another? Who would choose crime? That's the question I ask. Thank you.